Welcome back to Author Journey. My name is CJ Anaya, and today is going to be really, really fun because I am going to be interviewing author Andrew Joyce. Um, Andrew and I met uh, a while back when he contacted me about doing an interview or a review for his book, Molly Lee, and it was just so good. Um, and I have not read a lot of Westerns since high school, um, mainly because uh, I was into it with my grandfather, reading a lot of Western books, and then uh, when he passed away, um, I just didn't get into it quite a bit. And so it was kind of nice to go back to that when Andrew contacted me and, and asked if I would read the book and review it, and it was really, really wonderful. So um, I just wanted to bring him on board and have him talk a little bit about his process when it comes to researching books. Because when I read Molly Lee, I was thinking to myself, man, this has so much detail in it. And just the historical aspects of it were amazing. What they wore, you know, what the natives did, uh, the, the climate at the time, how it was between um, Native Americans and uh, the people who were settling, and just uh, Molly Lee's struggles throughout all of it, ranching. I mean, there was just so much to it. And so I thought, I really need to get Andrew on here to talk about how important it is to research a book and how he does it. So just a little bit about Andrew before he, he teaches us all of his pearls of wisdom here. Um, Andrew Joyce left high school at 17 to hitchhike throughout the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, which I think is so cool. I would love to do that. Um, he wouldn't return from his journey until years later when he decided to become a writer. Joyce has written five books. His first novel, Redemption, uh, The Further Adventures of Huck Finn, and Tom Sawyer was awarded the Editor's Choice Award for Best Western of 2013. A subsequent novel, Yellow Hair, received the Book of the Year Award from Just Reviews and Best Historical Award from uh, Colleen's Book Reviews. Joyce now lives aboard a boat in, Florida, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida with his dog, Danny, that's an awesome name, um, where he's busy working on his next book, tentatively titled uh, Mahoney, An American Story. Uh, so is that right? That's, is that the title you've decided on? Or... Uh, so far, okay. Awesome. <laughs> so I'm going to turn the time over to you um, and just uh, you know ask you to expound on your process of research, the importance of it. I just I just want to hear what you have to say about all that. You may be sorry for asking me, but uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes I, I don't know when to stop. <laughs> all right. This is what happened. Um, I learned about research. I won't say the hard way, but my first book, there, I, Redemption, about Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer, I brought them up as adults in the Old West. And I kind of based it loosely on Mark Twain's life. Mark Twain went to, uh, joined the Confederacy, fought one battle, and left. I had them do that. I had Tom go to Hawaii. And, well, Huck became kind of like a uh, Wyatt Earp type guy. Anyway, so I write the book, and I do a lot of research about Hawaii, the uh, names of the, like Diamond Head had a different name back then, where Mark, anyway, I did a lot of research, but when the reviews started coming in, I had made two mistakes. One, I had the year wrong by one year. I was off one year by an event. The second one, I had my hero, Huck Finn, putting the wrong uh, caliber bullet into his, 40, into his Winchester. I never heard of the end of it. I got a reviews. I would have given him five stars, but he had the wrong bullet. And so that, <laughs> it was good because it taught me, my very first novel, taught me the importance of research. Mm -hmm. So, um, as you mentioned, uh, Molly Lee was, it's a standalone book, but uh, I had three books in the series, each one a standalone. But Molly Lee, and as you know, Huck and Tom weren't in there at all, but it was the second book in the series. And I had to research how to categorize, uh, as you mentioned, everything, the dust. And it was, I found old diaries, guys that were on categorize. They're in archives. Wow. You, know, you gotta, you got to dig into it. Yeah. And then, you know, that, that was hard. I mean, but the, another way I watched old um, movies from the 30s. Uh, there's a, a, one of John Wayne's first movies, 1930. They used actually the wagons, the uh, planes. They were still around, and the 
children that made the trip, they were children at the time, they hired them to bring the wagons, and it was really authentic, huh. the dust and everything. So I watched that movie. So the movies, the diary, reading by great novelists, um, that, that their descriptions and so forth, you just bring it all in like a soup, and you let it ferment, or at least I do in my head, and then you can put it out there. It, it's got to be right, like I said, or, or people are going to, um, you know, call you up on it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's your name on the book. Right. You don't want to look stupid. And I'll tell you a little story. When movies first started in the early, early 20s, in the singles, I mean in the, um, in the 20s, um, they did costume dramas. And, you know, Louis XIV, the, the, Revol the French Revolution. And... They got it wrong. Uh -huh. They just said, oh, they threw this. And back then, there was no internet or anything. People actually took the time to stop, write a letter, put a stamp on it, and mail it to the studio saying, you don't know what you're talking about, which taught the studios a lesson about research. And after that, subsequent to that, they they had the, they amassed these vast research libraries that were on the studio lots. Huh. And when they all, excuse me, the 70s, they auctioned it off. I was watching it. They had books, anyway, after that initial thing in the early 20s, they never made a mistake again. So research is important if you're going to put anything up there, their movies, books, whatever. You've got to know what you're talking about. Anyway, so, just a right. little aside. All right, so, uh, two other things uh, on why research is important. Um, my third book in the series was Resolution, Huck Finn's Greatest Adventure. Uh -huh. I had him up in the Yukon in 1896 for the gold rush. By then, he's 60 years old. And I live in Florida. I've seen snow three times in my life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was like to um, be in 70 degree below weather, but I had to describe it. So the way I did it was I read everything I could. I read probably 20 books. My, the best guy was Jack London, who was actually there. Uh -huh. had, I, and I read nonfiction books. I read about dog sledding. I learned, I, I can't, you know, I learned how to dog sled. I, I just, and then you put it all together, and then when you throw it out there, now my books are getting reviews where, oh, this guy just knows what he's talking about. I actually don't, but uh, <laughs> I anyway, research, and uh, it looks like I know what I'm talking about, and you, you got you to gotta have that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one last example for my novel Yellow Hair, which uh, chronicled it. I got that series out of the way and I did another novel, Yellow Hair, about uh, the injustices uh, to the Sioux Nation starting in 1805 going through Wounded Knee, 1890. And I even went back to the first time they met white men in 1749, all that stuff. I learned to speak Lakota. Wow. There's an online thing, Lakota uh, Language Consortium. And I learned the language so because I wanted to make this authentic, and instead of saying, you know, Black Eagle Feather, I used their Lakota name. And then for, for my readers, I put in parentheses. But, you know, so you have to do, you really have to, and my research usually takes longer than writing a book. But my, up to this point, my, my books have all, even the series have all been historical fiction. Mm -hmm. And you really got what you're doing. And I would say... I don't just stop and research and then write a book. I'll be writing it, I'll get to a point, I'll stop, do all the research I gotta do, finish it, and then move on. So it's right research, right research, at least for me. Okay. So anyway. right. Any questions? <laughs> yes, I have a couple. Okay, so that's great because I think that some people probably just research the crap out of things before they even write it. But I think that's probably very smart that you write. And then when you come to a point where you realize I need to research this, then you can spend the time that you need on that aspect of it. When you are trying to find books on historical, um, uh, things, you know, where do you find that? Like, is it, is it a difficult process to go to the library and, and find like archived books on these things? Cause I would imagine these are books that are not being read a lot, you know, <laughs> it's well, not just going to be in the front of the library. So, well, two things. First of all, I'm an old guy. <laughs> I'm before the internet, and and even before I became a writer, I was always interested in stuff. 
and I wake up one morning, and I Saturday morning, okay, the word Canada come from? I, go, I don't know. I drive to the library, spent half a day finding out where it came from, <laughs> and uh, so that was hard. And thank God for the internet, it's a lot easier. By the way, Canada came from uh, a French guy and an Indian were uh, paddling a canoe by a, a settlement. And the French guy says to the Indian, what is that over there? And the Indian said, Canada, which means little village. That's where it came from. Interesting. <laughs> and it had nothing to do with writing or anything else. <laughs> but anyway, my point is I used to spend a lot, a lot of time in the library. Now, with the internet, uh, it's easy, and there's a great place called archive.org. You can find almost anything on there. That's where I find these diaries from, I want diaries from a, a cattle, blade, you know, whatever. Uh -huh. and, and, oh, and, and I also use um, uh, newspaper articles from way back then, because they're archived, but sometimes you have to go to the city. I, I'm not physically go, but you can go and ask them to find articles and they'll print them out at a nominal cost and so forth. Because you want to get help thinking as these events happened. Mm -hmm. You don't want a historical thing, you want it just as it's happening. Right. So, right. So. And is it with these types of books, is that how you figured out, you know, the clothing of that day and age, the types of tools that they used? I mean it's very detailed. I just I don't even know how you would think, because in my mind, I would just call it a pot. You know, if they're cooking something, I'd call it a pot. But what if it wasn't called that? And it wouldn't occur to me. So, I mean, how do you get so detailed? Well, well, in, well I, uh, in resolution, I had Huck and Molly, Huck and Molly get together in that book. And she's like 54. Uh -huh. And they're in the uh, hotel before they go up north. And they're lovers. Uh -huh. And he's taking off her clothes. I mean, I, I had to research what women's undergarments were <laughs> in 1894 or whatever. So, yeah, I didn't want to say he took off her panties. No, he <laughs> took off her, I, I, now I can't remember what it was, pantaloons or whatever. Right. That's not the word. But anyway, but women had all these different things, different names. And, and that's what gives it authenticity, you know what I'm saying? Right. Well, I mean, yeah. And like I said, it's probably thanks to those two people that gave me the lousy reviews on my first book. I got to thank them for keeping me honest. Right. No, yeah, I hear you there. I, it's very interesting how uh, critical reviews um, that are spot on about stuff actually really help us better our writing, kind of give us that wake up call. Exactly. For and, sure. And everyone's, you know, we all want the greatest reviews ever. I, I've been very fortunate. Um, my averages are up there, but. And if I get a, 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 a bad review, if they don't like it, so be it. You can't please everyone. Right. But if I get a bad, uh, say, a three-star, and they give me a critique mm -hmm. why they didn't like it, maybe I'll take it under advisement, maybe I'll just say they didn't get it. Uh -huh. And what kind of advice to anyone out there that might be watching this that, that are writers? Mm -hmm. Never, ever, ever, ever respond to a negative review. Mm -hmm. Just take it like a man or like a woman. And right. It. You respond to a negative review, all you're going to do is get 10 more. Right. All their friends give you negative reviews. Right. Okay. No, that's very good advice. That is very good advice. Thank you for that. Uh, no. Especially, I've never done it, but I've read a lot, especially on Goodreads. Yeah. There's a whole entree of people on Goodreads that just go around. I, I've gotten... Um, in my last book, Yellow Hair, I've gotten two one stars on Goodreads, mm -hmm. and I know for a fact that people didn't read it. So mm -hmm. they go and say, well, who is this person? And I look, and they put down 60 reviews in like uh, 60 minutes. They just go down one one star, oh, two, you know. Uh -huh. and I, don't, I, can't, I can't contact them and say, what the hell, because they uh -huh. turned off all their friends. And, right. You know, you just have to sit there and take it. It burns the hell out of me. I don't mind one star if they read the book. Uh huh. But they don't read it. That really burns me. But yeah, yeah. no, I, yeah. Well, there are trollers, and I've talked to to people on YouTube about that a little bit too. There's always going to be a troller out there who uh, is just you know trying to target someone, and of course you don't engage. You know, you try not to engage with that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, Andrew, you are launching a book soon. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Uh, I'm not launching it soon. I've launched it. You've launched it. Well, then I'm way off. Well, I'm, 
it just came out last day or so. Oh, okay. Um, as a writer, you might appreciate this. Two hundred eighteen thousand words. Oh my! Oh my gosh! <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. That's a lot of words, Andrew. But that cover looks awesome. Oh, thank you. It's a uh, it's a collection of short stories I've written over the years. Uh huh. And twenty five percent, fifty percent are true. Have you read any of my Danny stories? No. The Danny, Danny the dog. No. Oh, he's famous. I didn't know that. Are these children's stories? You have like a whole line no, of children's okay. books? Uh, okay. Uh, to market my books, I started writing uh, as Danny the dog. He's my real dog. Okay. And he's cute as a bun and everything. So then one blogger, book blogger, asked me to write a monthly column. I mean, I've got them asking me to write it weekly, but I just don't have it into me. Anyway, right. so I write it. And his narrative, he's very, very... Uh, Intelligent, but his narrative is what an idiot his master is. He doesn't call me his master, he calls me his human. So, uh, actually, women, when I say yeah, women, are, I live in Fort Lauderdale, women have flown in from Canada, uh -huh. from around the country, just to meet Danny. They email me, we're coming to see Danny. And I, well, I said, no, I'm not gonna, we're not going to be here, we're going to New York, which I'm not. I just don't want to see anyone. But no, they come anyway. I, and when they come, I have fun with them and everything. But anyway, Danny is very, very popular. Uh -huh. And he writes his monthly column. So anyway, on this book, 50%, I mean, I'm sorry, 25% of the stories are Danny stories. Okay. The other 25%, and then basically then they're nonfiction. They're about our adventures, the walking and this, you know, uh -huh. whatever. But he has a take on stuff. And then the other 25% are my misspent youth when I was hitchhiking, my hitchhiking adventures. Uh-huh. And when I first... When I first got off the road, and uh, so that's nonfiction. So anyway, half the book is fiction, half the book is nonfiction, and I got uh, I, there's 90 stories in there. They range from 100 words to 21,000 words. Wow! And everything. Wow! So, yeah, I thought I should put it in two volumes, but I said, Nah, I'm moving on. I got to write Mahoney. I right. <laughs> so anyway, that's the book. Oh, and and. As to research, there's one book in, I mean, one story in here. It's about an old, this is the fiction, it's about one, an old rodeo guy. After he got too old to do the rodeo and everything, mm -hmm. it's a kind of a love story. He finds love and all that stuff. But I had to learn about the rodeo. I had to learn what shoot dogging is. Oh, my <laughs> God. That's a, not on my road, that's my rodeo because that was his life. And it's only, uh, you know, maybe 4,000 words, but, you know. Uh huh. So, but you suddenly yeah. had to become an expert in that topic because that's that's what you were writing about. But my point is, even if it's a short story, right? You gotta know what the hell you're talking about, right? To become on this silly or whatever. right? Yeah, it's not gonna be believable. Well, that I'm actually really excited that you've written stories about you know your journeys hitchhiking because I've really wanted to pick your brain about that. Now I'm just gonna go buy the book so that I don't have to pick your brain about. Oh, listen, listen, <laughs> I'm glad we're talking now. After you read some of the stuff I've done in my youth, uh huh, you go to read my phone number. <laughs> no, I think that that's going to be a lot of fun to read. No, and I think it's great that you're going to share it because it's for everybody. You know, you need you need people, your readers, to to come to know you a little bit more, and it makes you very relatable and approachable, and just you know, it's fun to learn about you as an author and the things that that. Uh, inspired you you know because I'm sure that all of that traveling has inspired you in some way to write some of these books and and to write more books in the future you know you'll get great ideas from that so yeah um I don't know about inspired I, I would say living right experiences mm -hmm. and in, in my fiction writing is um you can draw that with someone I met once in the middle of the desert Try to kill me. Oh. I would take that. Which, which happened? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I, got, I can't believe it. I gotta buy this I book. <laughs> I'm still here. I would take that and put it into a character in one of my books. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, draw on life experiences. I like that. Right. Um, and the very first story in here is called The Swamp. Mm -hmm. And uh, do we have time? Yeah, absolutely, we've got time. Okay, so. I'm 17, it's the very first time away from home, and I went, I was uh, between junior and senior year in high school, I just said, I want to go to California, stuck my thumb out. Mm -hmm. I'm coming back in Tallahassee, in 
and him are coming through. It's three in the morning, and, and the road sweep, uh, snakes through a swamp. This guy picks me up, and as I get in a car, he says, you can call me Teddy Bear. And it turns out he was an ambulance driver, and he said, I love being around dead people. And he's going on and on, and it's very foggy. We're going like 20 miles an hour, and I'm, I'm 17. I'm, I'm, okay, you know, I, I just take it like it's normal. Anyway, he takes out, and he tries to kill me. He says he can throw it, and he chases me through a swamp, and I, I get away. That was my very first hitchhiking adventure. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> and then you kept hitchhiking after that, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did it for a few years, but um, I was stupid. <laughs> and, and the thing is, I was young, and I got a lot of rights. I tried to stick my thumb now. I won't get anywhere. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Right. People are more likely to pick up 17-year-olds. I guess that makes sense. Well, I'll tell you, half, fit, exactly 50% of my rides were gay guys trying to get lucky. Oh, that's that's I, scary. I young, no, I'm young and good, you know, relatively good looking. But, you know, I, just, I would just firmly say, that's not me. Uh-huh. And, and most of them would, no problem, and we ride on and talk and so on and so forth. That is crazy. Um, <laughs> got time for one real quick. A good, no, this is a good story. It involves Johnny Cash and Chris Christopherson. Oh, let's hear it. Okay. I'm hitch, it's in the book, too. It's, I'm hitchhiking outside of Memphis going to New York. Mm-hmm. And I'm not getting any rides. I'll make this short. So anyway, this black Mustang screeches to a hall, and the guy says, Hey, you're going to Nashville. Can't give you a ride. I go, yeah, yeah, no problem. Jump in. On the zombie. Oh, that's Johnny Cash. But he doesn't say anything. You know, back then he was on whites and, you know, speed and stuff. Uh-huh. But eventually, we shake hands and say, glad to meet you, Mr. Cash. So a short version is we talk, blah, blah, blah. We get home. He had just gotten married, June Carter. Mm-hmm. And she wasn't home. He invites me for lunch. And uh, so we're there. He makes me a couple of ham sandwiches, gives me a beer. And I'm eating them. We're talking. They're shooting, shooting uh, you know, talking. And then the doorbell rings. So he goes out. He comes back with Chris Christopherson. Before he was famous, and he's working at a recording studio as a maintenance man. He goes, but he knew John from the recording studio. He goes, John, and he, John called himself John. He goes, I'm John Cash, not John. Uh huh. So then, and John said, Yeah, you want a sandwich? And he goes, I just said, Be out on my lunch break. But I got a song I want you to hear. I just wrote it, and that's okay. If I tell him, said that I'm chewing down on my, I don't know who this guy Chris is, but I know who John is. Uh-huh. I'm chewing on my ham sandwich. John gets a guitar, comes back, Chris tunes it up, and he sings this song, which I don't remember what it was, so don't ask me. <laughs> anyway, so when he gets done, John says, uh, uh, nice song, but it's not for me. And Chris said, fine. So the three of us just drink a beer. And then I say, well, it's time for me to go, guys. And they both offer to drive me back to the highway. I said, now, 22 blocks. So, but this is what I want to tell you. When I get to New York, I used to travel with one of those old suitcases, you know, the hard kind you can sit on. Uh-huh. They don't like them. I opened, it's Donna had asked me, he goes, do you have any money? And I think I was like 18, 19 at the time. I go, no, of course I don't have any money. Who has money to take a time? Right. So he said, I'm going to give you a sandwich. When I get to New York, I open my case, there's a hundred dollar bill sitting there that he must have put, I, he didn't say anything, he must have put it in when he went to like Chris. And, uh-huh. That's the kind of guy he was. That is so cool. So this story is in this book? Yeah, yeah. I had all these kind of things. I mean, I was down and someone uh, tried to kill me. and uh, It's a funny story. Uh-huh. It's a funny story. But someone tried to kill me and a guy I read down in Tijuana. I write it. It's kind of humorous, but and I ended up, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, uh, oh, and that had a very interesting uh I'm not even going to tell you the story, but I'm coming back once, and the, uh, this Apache Indian picked me up in mm-hmm. a pickup truck and took me home for the night. And he was doing a religion. He was a young kid like me. He had just quit college. And it, this is a long story. Uh, this is like 20,000 words. But we spent the night, and we did mescal. And I didn't know what it was, but we spoke with God, uh-huh. and we had a very religious experience. And he explained to me uh, the... the um, the Apache, that was a name given to them by the Zuni Indians. It means enemy. They call themselves the Dene, D-E-N-E-E, the Dene, which means the people. 
he explained all that, told me the whole history of Geronimo, uh-huh. and John, Ron, Geronimo's own words. Anyway, stuff like that was always happening. That is so uh, amazing. No, that, that's, I don't know. I think that, you know, real life experiences obviously are so fascinating to read. I mean, you met Johnny Cash. You hung out with Native Americans. I'm sure that all sorts of really wonderful, incredible things happen. Um, and the way that you write stories is so much fun to read. It's so engaging. So I'm really excited to grab this book. And I'm going to put a link to this book in the description so that everybody will be able to go and get it too. Because I'm sure once they hear about Johnny Cash and you almost getting killed, they're going to be like, I really want to read this. This is going to be entertaining. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, um, okay. That's it. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Oh, well, well yeah. If you. One last thing on, on, on um, research. Yes. Let's hear it. It has nothing to do with me. <laughs> you know who David Balabachi is? No. He's like uh, as well read and sells as many books as Stephen King. Okay, well then obviously I'm not as cultured as I thought I was. <laughs> no, 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 it's just probably not your genre. Okay. And you know who Lee Child, Child is? Yes. He writes the Reacher, Jack Reacher. Right, uh huh, the Jack Reacher. Movie. Yes. Okay, my point is you can tell these guys to research, and this is what us authors do. And you got to try not to, not to do it. We spend so much time researching, and we get to know, like the, like Baldacci, I was reading one of his books. He learned, how, you know, research how to break down a gun. I mean, this, that, everything, and he puts it in there. It's two paragraphs. It's really not. Easy. Believe me, I give my right arm to sell as many books as he does. But it's not that. But the point is, we go to all this trouble to research, and we want to show off. Mm-hmm. And that's one thing. Do the research, use what you can, but don't go overboard trying to show people how much you know. Right. I made that mistake a couple times. And right. My editor, another thing, you've got to have a good editor. And uh, my editors throughout the years always said, hey, cut that out, cut that out. And you know how it is being off the, my genius words cut them out. What are you, crazy? Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but you know the saying, less is more. Right. Yeah. No. It, yeah. You need to know the research. You need to know the backstory. But if you put it all in, it can bog the story down. It can slow the pace. Yeah. It's not necessary for us to know everything. Just enough for it to move the story along. That can be hard, though, when you have learned all of these cool facts to not put all of it in. Yeah. That's so, true. Anyway, I'm sitting here pontificating like the old part that I am, but it's been a pleasure. I love your smile. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I've enjoyed this conversation, Andrew. I really appreciate you doing this with me. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on here and for talking about your process and for helping other people understand the importance of research. I really, really appreciate it because I know that you've had a a busy week and lots of things to do. So thank you so much for, for stopping on the channel and talking to us. Thank you very much for asking me. Absolutely. All righty. And uh, I will leave that link for you guys uh, so you can grab his book. And uh, please comment and like the video if you have uh, any questions about research. If you have any questions for Andrew, I'll be sure to pass them along. And we will talk to you guys later. You have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye.